Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. And I, I knew this industry wanted close ties with Europe, but I must say I'm very struck by Jeremy's example of actually swimming the channel uh, <laughs> that make the point. And I realize it's for charity. Um, I'm going to just talk about a few things briefly. One is what, how, what the election has changed. One is what the options facing the government are. Another one is where Europe uh, seems to be in this. And then the final one is what business can do, because there is a window for business to do quite a bit in speaking to government on this, it seems to me. Well, the ele election has changed the mood. It has not changed exactly what ministers were saying up till this morning, when the Chancellor got up and started talking in his delayed Mansion House speech, talking about staying in the customs union, at least for a bit. The position of the cabinet has been, uh, at, at least you know, the, the, the letter of it, has been, look, we're still going for what the Prime Minister said early in the year, out of the single market, uh, out of the customs union, uh, out of Europe. But clearly the mood has changed, and all kinds of things that were clearly off the table, or seemed to be clearly off the table after she made that speech at Lancaster House, are now back on. And so we have a much more fluid picture. This should be good for business. Uh, many options that are better economically than certainly than leaving without a deal and the many things that she was talking about, uh, many options seem to be back on the table. What is bad uh, for business and for many people is the sheer amount of political uncertainty that exists and the likelihood, um, I don't mean the probability, but the high chance uh, that this government is not going to make it through all these very complex and controversial negotiations and get them all through Parliament. So what have we got? Well, we've got a, a range of options. We've got staying, staying in Europe, but let's put that one aside because at least at the moment uh, it seems not to be quite on the table. If though we did start heading back to that, we wouldn't get quite what we've had. We would probably get what uh, Cameron had before the negotiations, so before the small concessions he got. So we've got staying in the single market, um, we've got a customs union or the EEA Norway option, and these are not the same, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about them. We've got the bespoke deal, the free trade agreement that we've been talking about this morning, and uh, that, that we kicked off this morning saying, you know, wouldn't it be great, as Mike said, a comprehensive bespoke EU-UK agreement. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about that, or we've got the option of no deal. And I'm not going to talk very much about that because I think we are pretty much agreed in this room that that is um, pretty terrible for many people, including this, this industry. So what do these, these, these options look like? Um, well, let me take the EEA one, the Norway one. And Norway, Norwegians have been quite vocal in the past, um, the past week or two with saying, look, are you really sure you might want this uh, as an alternative to coming, you know, com coming out quickly of, 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 uh, the, of the single market? Now, it, look, it re retains many of the benefits of the single market, and Britain would have to sign up still to the four freedoms, though it would retain a bit, of, a bit more uh, control over immigration. It would have a bit more control over courts. Uh, some things like that. Um, but it would uh, not entirely solve the Irish border problem, and it wouldn't solve some of the questions that this industry is raising about, um, you know, so there would be free movement of goods, but it wouldn't uh, do away with the friction of tariffs and so on. So attractions there, um, but, but disadvantages. We've got the customs union, which Ian was talking very eloquently about just before the break. And I must say I'm more skeptical than Ian is that this solves many of the problems um, of, of this uh, industry, um, and it doesn't solve uh, the problems at all of other industries, particularly services, which are more than two-thirds of the UK economy. Customs union is, is quite a complex thing when one gets down to it. And if you look at uh, the Turkish example, so a great, Turkey signed into the EU common tariffs. <coughs> Um, but it doesn't always work to Turkey's advantage. It's very asymmetrical. So it means that if the EU does a free trade agreement with another country, as it's done with South Korea, then South Korea gets uh, access to the EU and to Turkey's markets. But Turkey didn't sign that deal with South Korea, and Turkey doesn't get access uh, on those terms to the South Korean market. So it's asymmetrical. 
And the more free trade agreements the EU signs, the worse that position gets for Turkey. And it's something that they're quite um, shrill about. In fact, even before Turkish politics got into its current paranoid phase, if I can put it that way, they were calling it one of the great Ottoman capitulations, this thing that we might be aspiring to. Um, Turkey, so you might say, well, look, can't Turkey go and do its own free, uh, free trade agreements with other countries, which, contrary to much of what you read about this, it actually is allowed to do, but what it can't do is do those setting aside EU tariffs. It has to keep those EU tariffs. So it's negotiating with other countries with one hand behind its back. And it's a very difficult position. It's also to make things frictionless, taking in all kinds of EU regulations into its own laws, to help the help trade move along. Um, and it seems to me, if we're going to go that way, we don't want quite what Turkey's got. It's not as neat an off-the-shelf option as it seems. We'd want it tailored a bit, an off-the-shelf suit, if you like, with quite a bit of adapting to make it more comfortable for us. Because the position that Turkey's in is quite difficult. And what we'd want to ask for specifically is to see if we could get a fudge to get access to the EU's free trade agreements. And lawyers are divided on this point. So this is not as simple, it seems to me, as it might uh, seem. Although it does have attractions, one of the big ones is that it would solve the Irish border problem, or significant bits of it. But the services industries uh, would come storming in and say, look, it doesn't really solve any of ours. So those are two there, and they're in play in a way that they weren't before the election, but they're not the simple option that we might want. And um, then the, the free trade bespoke deal. Well, it depends what's in that. It sounds great now because we imagine it being tailored around the things we want, but it's going to be tailored as well, even more perhaps, around the things the Europeans want. Which brings me on to the question of what do they want? Well, at the moment we have risen again, the Franco-German axis in this, the two powerful countries in Europe very much determining the terms of this, with President Macron uh, doubly enforced after the parliamentary elections um, in, in his position of strength. But the Germans are interesting on this, and they say, look, he's really, he's got to deliver on, the, on the, the, what he said he will change about France itself before we really accept this as a sort of double-headed partnership. And, and it, it seems to me it is very clearly Berlin that is driving uh, the terms of this, uh, of this negotiation. And no, they don't want Britain to crash out without a deal at all. I think that is clear. Um, but no, they're not, going, they're, they're not on for a very easy negotiation either. Now, we can already see the fudges coming in, which are going to walk everyone back from the cliff edge. And it's encouraging um, that we can begin to see a few of these, uh, the British concessions already, which have been some weeks in preparation, agreeing not to demand uh, trade talks in parallel. You can begin to see people talking about breaking down the famous Brexit exit bill into as much smaller pieces uh, so that they can be ne negotiated separately and it doesn't look like such a big lump. You can hear the talk of, of concession, but there's some, still some very chunky stuff in there. And on the British side, it seems to me, the weakness of this election, even if it was billed as the Brexit election, is that no party dealt with the painful compromises that this country is going to have to make if it really is coming out of the EU and wanting to retain some control over immigration and some sovereignty over courts. And no party did this. Uh, the uh, Labour manifesto, it seems to me, was uh, pure cake, uh, have your cake and eat it. So was the DUP, which was saying, uh, we want to come out of the single market but retain all the benefits. And the Conservative one said, trust us, um, we'll get a good deal. Uh, or we'll get the best deal that can be got without saying what that might be or what the red lines might be. Um, uh, and the Lib Dems who did say stay in uh, got hammered. Um, so we still have this very difficult uh, public debate um, and a parliamentary debate along with it in the very, very unstable politics that we have at the moment. Let me just say briefly then, what can business do? Well, um, when, when the referendum happened, businesses very sensibly started uh, trying to make their views known to, um, to government. There were some awkward awkwardnesses on some businesses uh, sides, particularly in the kind of medium-sized businesses who'd had a government affairs department perhaps and used it for trying to work out what parliamentary committees were doing and suddenly whirled around on it and said, how does a customs union work? And there was a sort of yelp of pain. Um, but um, 
business, I think, was very intelligent of putting cases about supply chains and so on to government. And there was the months of what we now call the sponge. All kinds of stuff went in. Absolutely nothing came out. It didn't mean it was wasted, but it wasn't being joined up particularly in government at all. There is now a chance to make those arguments again, and I think more likelihood that they will stick. It's not that nothing has happened on the government side. Actually, a great number of experts have been hired. Officials are much, much more expert than they were on all kinds of things like supply chains and the different strengths and vulnerabilities of the British economy. But there is still an immense amount to do, and the next uh, uh, two, three months seem to me prime time again to make those arguments. Mm. Broman, thank you. Let's turn to Chris Giles, who's economics editor of the Financial Times. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justin. I'm going to be quite blunt about the UK economy, um, where we are and what's happened in the past year, nearly a year on since the Brexit vote. The first thing that we know is that economists who were split uh, basically on, on, as, a, as a profession got the short term economics wrong. Economists were pretty gloomy. Uh, and that included me at this time last year about the immediate consequences of Brexit. Most people weren't forecasting a disaster, but forecasting the growth in the economy to essentially slow pretty much to a crawl. And that's not what happened. The economy grew 0.6% in the third quarter of the last year, 0.7% in the fourth quarter. That's above average growth. So we did better than a normal period in the second half of 2016. What happened? Why did economists get that wrong? It's very important to look at when you make a mistake, why you got it wrong, and see what that means for the future. Uh, the big mistake people made was that they had a, essentially a one-for-one -one relationship between uncertainty in the world, in, in the economics, uh, and the performance of the UK economy. So we thought that because there was pol political and economic uncertainty, people would essentially tighten their belts, would draw back spending somewhat, and that simply didn't happen. Uh, other things were, were right. Uh, sterling fell just about as, as much as people predicted, and so it leaves us in the position we're in now where the effects of sterling's fall are now beginning to be felt pretty widely across the economy. So what happened? We had very strong consumption of all of that growth since the referendum vote 85% of it came from household consumption, and the rest of it was essentially from other very transitory uh, aspects of the UK economy. Nothing, nothing came from business investment. Uh, nothing came from net exports. Zero. Well, in fact, negative. So Brexit and the fall in sterling hasn't helped our exporting position so far, hasn't helped businesses feel it's a time to invest. How strong are consumers? We had this pretty strong growth. Uh, at the same time, the savings ratio, the household savings ratio, has fallen to its lowest recorded level ever. So we are now, as a nation, household sector, saving less as a proportion of income than we ever have before. There are some reasons why that's going to get revised up, because there's some dodginess in the stats, and that will change slightly, but it won't take that picture away. We know in your industry you've been having very strong motor vehicle sales based on uh, finance growing at 10% plus a year in, uh, for new vehicles. That can't continue. We cannot have 10% credit growth a year in an economy that nominally grows 3-4% before you take account of inflation. So we have been living uh, in a period of a temporarily strong period the first quarter was the first quarter of payback we've seen from that 0.2% growth, the lowest in the G7, pretty much the lowest in the Eurozone. And uh, it's at a period where most other economies, advanced economies, are doing uh, quite well. So we had a good period, but with some clouds. And the other thing that didn't happen, we didn't have any sort of financial disruption, which was, let's face it, what the rest of the world cared about most. They didn't really care whether Britain decides uh, it's in or out of the EU, so long as it doesn't hurt them. It's pretty clear now globally that Brexit is not a systemic global crisis. We, if we're holding a gun, the only place it's pointing is at our own feet. 
We don't have any ability to, to bring anyone else down now. That's well understood. Uh, so we need to make sure we don't point it at our feet. Um, so where are we? We've got pretty full employment. Uh, we have uh, a still well-functioning uh, economy, not with productivity growing in the economy as a whole, not in the automotive sector, very, very slowly. In fact, it fell half percent in the first quarter of the year. So we have the same problems we've had in the UK economy for a very long time, pretty much full employment, but yet at living standards that people are not happy with, as we saw in the election. We're now seeing inflation rising, so this is the effect of sterling. It's not coming through unemployment, but it's coming through the price level. So people are going to be squeezed further, so we can't expect the household spending to continue to grow as fast as it was growing in the second half of last year. We can't expect people to keep on borrowing or saving less over time. These things do have limits. So we should expect a period of slower growth where the effect of sterling's fall comes through people being poorer than they otherwise wanted to be, and probably that means less happy, and I think that's part of what we saw in the election. What does it mean for the Brexit? I don't want to, I don't want to, to tread on the same ground of, as Bronwyn just has, but I want to mention two things. One is one part of the negotiation that's coming up very early on, it's in the first part of the negotiation, is the money. This is obviously not directly relevant to an industry like the automotive industry to say, oh, go on, government, you get on with sorting out this argument about the money. Um, but I would say don't be complacent about this. It is a zero-sum game. We either pay more, in which case Europe gets less, or we pay less and we're happier and they're not as happy. So it is in a negotiation that is not a part of the negotiation we could say there's a mutual benefit in, in us agreeing. This is a part where if Bronwyn's right, we can maybe break it down and everyone sort of parcel it away and stick it under carpets and sort of forget about it. But this is a zero-sum game. And we have had uh, people on the, in the EU27 side say it's absolutely important Britain pays. You know, there's a gross figure of 100 billion euros out there to leave, but let's, let's not exaggerate this number, net, that when we net off what they owe us, that would be more or less in the sort of 60 billion euros, in sterling terms about 50 billion quid. Let's not think this is a huge amount of money, it's not something to, to give up the things that you might want, single market, customs union, over 50 billion quid, 50 billion quid, 50 with nine noughts on the end. Big number for any individual person in this country, obviously. Uh, but let's put it into a, a bigger context. Compared with the size of our national debt, we'd have to borrow this money. Our national debt is 83% of our size of our economy. It would rise it, raise it to about 85 and a half. So it's 2.5% of the size of the UK economy, rising the national debt from 83 to 80, 85 and a half doesn't really change the outlook of Britain. If we scuppered the whole negotiations on the money and industries like yours said, oh, just let them get on with it, and then we felt fall into a position where we don't agree, that would be a tragedy. So we must actually try and make sure that that doesn't happen. And the second thing I think is also where there's definitely a, a, a big chink, chink of light is the transition element of any deal. Uh, the, one of the things the Chancellor said this morning was he didn't use the word implementation, or he did use that word as well, but he also used the word transition, which he's been very clear not to use because it's been a sort of a no-no word in government because that could mean a transition to nowhere well, rather than implementing a final deal to a destination you've got to, you've already agreed. He, for, for the first time, used that today. So I think getting that sort of... Having government realise that transitioning in pretty much the arrangements we've got today is something that industry should push for because then you've got time to work out what the long-term uh, trade-offs and costs and benefits of moving are. That, that would require government to make big concessions and the Brexit, people who really want a, a clean Brexit, getting out quickly, would hate that. But that is probably, I think, one of the best hopes we've got. Mm. It's very interesting. We talked to Dan Hannan on the programme yesterday, towards the end yeah. of the programme, the, the Conservative MEP and one of the kind of intellectual kind of powerhouses of, of, of behind Brexit. And he, he wasn't a million miles from that. And he was pretty relaxed about some 
long-term transition, yeah. etc. We, we talked to him just after Nick Clegg, and I couldn't really see much that they disagreed on in a, in a, in a, in so, a and sense. That, that's precisely why I think it's the thing that industry should push for, because if you can get that, if you can get people saying, okay, we'll go for something that's not much change in the short term after mm. the two years, mm. then business can plan pretty much as business as usual for a period, and you can have a much, more, much calmer discussion yeah. about what changes might happen in the longer term. Okay, Chris, thanks. Uh, Professor Alan Winters is Professor of Economics at Sussex University. He's also the Director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Professor. Uh, thank you very much, Justin. Thank you, everyone. I want to make uh, three points. One follows on a little bit from what uh, uh, Chris has just said, and that is to say that trade agreements take time. We all know they take time, and the need for a transitional arrangement is so that we have time to negotiate a decent deal. The only way that one can settle a trade deal in the course of a year, certainly if you haven't done a great deal of preparation, is just get your wallet out and say, how much would you like? So if it's going to be a sensible negotiation, it's going to take longer than two years. Uh, just to illustrate that, you've all heard about the Canadian EU trade agreement, CETA. It's taken eight years to negotiate. The Walloonians tried to sabotage it. They've passed it. It's been ratified. It's due to be implemented on the 1st of July. But it might not be, because the European Union objects to the way that the Canadians might administer a quota for 18,000 tonnes of cheese. The Canadians have agreed to take more cheese, and we don't like the way they are divvying that up, so we might not implement it yet. Of course we will, but the point is these things depend on lots of other little players who've got things that are big to them and little to you. So it's just inevitable that we have to take time. We have internal politics to sort out, we've got to work out what our partners want, and we have all these, these sort of little irritants. So the transition, I think, is essential. We don't want a transition that we have to negotiate, because that would be like negotiating the trade agreement anyway. So the transition has to be, in a sense, adopted as a package. One possibility is just to say it's the entire status quo, the single market, the customs union, is effectively membership until we have fixed this thing and then we would leave. Another way is to say we leave and then we negotiate some off-the-shelf package like the European Economic Area or something like that, but we do then have to go to the World Trade Organization to get essentially them to agree or a waiver to be able to have zero tariffs with the EU but not zero tariffs with the US or with Japan. So it's complicated. Uh, second thing, as Bronwyn said, this is the time for business to make its voice heard. Um, you know, it's not all going to fall in one's lap. It actually does have to be organised and pushed for. Uh, the customs union is clearly important. Um, uh, we um, heard that from Ian. Uh, the single market is also very important. Remember that uh, your industry absorbs quite a lot of services. So if we get into a position where there's no trade agreement at all about services, service imports will be much more difficult to get. British service providers will become much less competitive. And so a lot of the things that we take for granted actually will become uh, more expensive. So I think it's very important to realize that, in a sense, we didn't quite deserve it, but suddenly everything is thrown up in the air again. The agenda has become much broader but it has also become much riskier, more difficult than, say, two months ago to predict where this thing might end. Uh, this is the time to intervene. The third point I want to make is that there's been a lot of brave talk over the last year. Don't hear it as much now about, don't worry about the European Union, no deal, it'd be fine. There are lots of other people we can trade with, and that will be fine. We can strike deals with them. It, it's, just, it's just not real. Uh, we send, we, we do half our trade with the European Union, and so to the extent that we do anything to disrupt that trade, we essentially have got to do an offsetting thing with just about everybody else in the world if we're going to increase trade to make up the difference. Uh, there are 53 countries with which we have free trade agreements already through the European Union, and Bronwyn said it was ambiguous, but most lawyers that I talk to say, there's nothing to discuss, you're out of those. We will fall out of those when we leave the European Union. And some of those are potentially quite important markets. Mm -hmm. 
Um, some of them are tiny, but some of them are quite important. And then there's negotiating with the nice Chinese, um, steel, I mean, I'm sure you know what you feel about steel imports, but there are other people who feel quite differently about steel imports. So actually settling free trade agreements with the rest of the world is also going to be politically complicated domestically. It's also going to be complicated and time absorbing for them. Why would they want to sign an agreement with us until we have settled our position in the World Trade Organization, our standard trade terms, and they know how we are going to interact with the European Union? So essentially, we're going to have to fix the relationship with the WTO. We're going to have to fix the relationship with the European Union. And then other people will be willing to have serious trade talks with us. Again. Uh, that is a transition that we haven't talked about very much, but if we had a reasonable transition period with the European Union, we could get a lot of the groundwork done uh, for these additional free trade agreements uh, that uh, some people think uh, will save us. So everything to play for and timing really is very important. It's going to take a very long time. Mm. Uh, Alan, thank you very much. Well, let us hear now from, in a sense, an outsider, but in a sense very much an insider when it comes to the business of doing these deals that we're talking about, because uh, Frank Samolis is partner and co-chair of international trade practice at uh, Squire Patent Boggs. Um, so he's an expert on international trade matters, including all of the details of these negotiations. You've represented, haven't you, well, both governments and, and companies as yes. well. Take it away. Thank you, Justin, and thank you all for having me. Uh, as everybody said here, this is very complicated. I'm going to make it more complicated by looking beyond the UK and Brexit to the United States, and specifically the trade policy of the Trump administration, which we are still trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, but some things are clear. Um, you heard during the campaign how much Donald Trump hated trade agreements. The, the United States is always on the short end of the agreements. There's a requirement for every president of the United States to file a trade agenda every year by statute. And President Trump filed his report in April, and there's nothing terribly surprising about it, you know, more robust agreements, greater enforcement. But one thing struck me, and that is a couple of paragraphs, and the title was, National Sovereignty Always Prevails Over Trade Policy. And what does that mean? It means that President Trump, a transactional president who thinks the United States has not gotten a great deal, does not think very highly of multilateral institutions like the WTO. And I'm sure he hasn't looked into the details of the WTO, but if I were a Steve Bannon or somebody like that and wanted to get the president's goat, I would say, in the old days, the GATT was really four entities that set all the rules. It was the US, the EU, Japan, and Canada. With the WTO, it's become more like the United Nations. Since the WTO, every trade law has been challenged. And the US loses cases. We lost a case to Antigua, a tiny speck of an island. We lost a case on underwear to Costa Rica. So if you can imagine somebody putting these arguments to Donald Trump, how do you think he would respond to the legitimacy of the WTO? National security prevails over trade policy. I will not be surprised if he decides we can ignore cases that we lose in the WTO. I wasn't elected uh, by the citizens of Geneva or Paris or London. I was elected to protect American workers. And if we lose cases there, go ahead and retaliate because we can retaliate more. That is not a far-fetched notion. The president has done some unprecedented things. He created an agency that didn't exist before in the White House called the National Trade Council, headed by a man by the name of Peter Navarro. Now, I never heard of Peter Navarro before, so I did some checking, and he wrote a couple of books, which I read. The first book was uh, The Coming Wars with China. The second one was Death by China. <laughs> This gives you some perspective for, for where Peter Navarro is coming from. Now, 
that, that council was created in January, it no longer exists. <laughs> Trump got rid of it last month. And Peter Navarro has now been relegated to an advisory role to the Secretary of Commerce. So things are constantly changing with respect to trade policy in the United States. In a minute, I'll get to how this applies to the UK. Uh, President Trump needs to understand that trade agreements require the equal voice of the United States Congress. If you remember nothing else from what I say today, remember that legally in the United States, any trade agreement, whether it's NAFTA, TPP, uh, US-Korea free trade agreement, are legally not treaties. Therefore, they are not self-executing. Therefore, we have to have Congress pass and implement into law every single trade agreement. This is a very complicated process. I can show, I actually have a, a PowerPoint that you can access or I can give you a copy of it, but this is a chart. I hope you can see this. You can see how many detailed points there are. I am convinced Donald Trump had no idea what was required to renegotiate NAFTA. First of all, he said Wilbur Ross was gonna be in charge and it turns out by law, he can't be in charge. It has to be the US Trade Representative. Secondly, for all these notifications, we are now at the very far left, the beginning of the process. And for all that Trump said about NAFTA, only last month did he do what he has to do by law, which is notify the Congress of his intent to negotiate or renegotiate an agreement. That means we now have a 90-day consultation period before the talks can even begin. So everything you're hearing about NAFTA the talks cannot begin by law until the end of August. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to talk about three things that I discovered while I was having my flights canceled yesterday coming here uh, that I think are very important in terms of uh, the UK and the automotive sector here. The first one has to do with unilateral actions by the president on trade. Professor Winters talked about steel. You may know that Donald Trump has invoked a rarely invoked law, the Trade uh, Expansion Act of 1962, which has to do with national security. If the president finds that national security is being threatened by imports, he can essentially do whatever he wants. Quotas, tariffs, voluntary restraint agreements. Just yesterday, Wilbur Ross said the president is going to make a dramatic announcement likely this week on the steel case. In the first place, this law has only been invoked really for petroleum imports, where I think you can agree that there really is a national security implication. Finding national security with respect to aluminum or steel is quite a different matter. The law gives the president 270 days to complete a very complicated investigation. Donald Trump wants to finish his investigations, two of them, in 60 days. They start in April. He will make an announcement by the end of this week. So if you're the automotive industry, you have to look at the implications for what is, I think, likely to be a significant significant protectionist action by the administration that doesn't require congressional approval. That's point number one. Article number two that I saw yesterday was Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, saying, the NAFTA negotiations are likely to go beyond this year. Professor Winter said these are complicated negotiations, and they sure are. I represented Peru on their free trade agreement with the US. I represented Korea and I represented Colombia. These take a long time. For anybody to think that beginning the negotiations at the end of August and finishing them by December is preposterous. Nevertheless, if you're looking at a global industry that's affected by NAFTA, there's probably no other industry more affected than the automotive sector. You have you know better than I do, billions of dollars invested to create an integrated supply chain that makes NAFTA work for automobile manufacturers. Not just US, but 
uh, European manufacturers who take advantage of NAFTA. So when the president said, I don't know what we're going to do, but one of the big issues is rules of origin, you ought to be thinking very carefully about how that could affect your interests, regardless of what's going on in Brexit. When I talked about this consultation period of 90 days between the Congress and the president, in Washington, that means the lobbyists are out in force. They talk to the members of Congress, and they tell them what they need to see in the agreement, what needs to be protected, what needs to be expanded. And if Donald Trump thinks he's going to get NAFTA negotiated without Congress, he's got another thing coming. This is how it works in Washington. I'll give you one quick example. On the Korea, example, uh, Korea Free Trade Agreement, where I represented Korea, the agreement was signed. It was negotiated. There was a big ceremony. The agreement was done. The president goes to the Congress, first to the Senate, and he gives it to the chairman of the Finance Committee, Senator Max Baucus from the great state of Montana. Uh, and Senator Baucus said, Mr. President, I've been telling you all along, you haven't done enough in this agreement for beef. I need Montana beef to have better access in Korea, and you haven't come close to that. And if you don't fix that, you won't have my support, and I'll work to defeat this agreement in the United States Senate. The president then goes to the House of Representatives and meets with Sandy Levin, the ranking Democrat on the Ways and Means Committee that has jurisdiction over on trade from the great state of Michigan. And Sandy Levin said, Mr. President, I've been telling you all along, you haven't done nearly enough for expanded market access for American automobiles in Korea. And until you fix that, I will oppose this agreement and I will lead the opposition of a Democratic president to the agreement in the House. So what happened? What happened was the negotiation of side letters. Side letters that basically changed the deal with respect to beef and automobiles, whether that's legally challengeable is an interesting question, but nevertheless, the Koreans had no choice. They had to accept that for the agreement to get through. Now, the third thing I want to mention is you probably read that yesterday it was announced that the US and the UK would begin discussions of a framework for a free trade agreement. It's unclear. Professor Winters is absolutely right. You've got commitments under Article 50 before you conclude agreement, but it doesn't stop you from initiating discussions. Remember, when Donald Trump was running for office, he said the first thing we'd do on trade would be to no negotiate a free trade agreement with the UK. And the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, came out and supported that which was politically very clever because it put President Obama in a box. Obama is committed to the U.S.-European free trade agreement. He can't support that. So he said, well, I support the U.K., but if they want a free trade agreement, they'll have to get to the end of the queue. He actually said queue, which I was impressed with. <laughs> so let's go back to NAFTA. There is no legal prohibition on any other country acceding to the NAFTA. Okay. We know what President Trump has said about NAFTA, the worst trade agreement ever negotiated in world history. So what if the UK were to apply for observer status, observer status to the NAFTA? If you're talking about a free trade agreement, Donald Trump could say, I fixed it. I was elected to fix NAFTA, and now we're going to call it the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, and now we've got the UK involved in discussions. The UK gets leverage relative to the EU. Understanding all the legal prohibitions, these are things that your industry needs to think about as the United States develops a very unpredictable trade policy. One thing that will not go away is the role of Congress. I can tell you now, just like it happened with the Korea Free Trade Agreement, the domestic automobile industry in the United States is all over these agreements. I am sure they are now consulting with their members to do, if they have to do it again, what they did on Korea. So I've probably talked too long, but I just wanted to leave those thoughts for you.
to think about as, and to make your lives more complicated if you fit that into the <laughs> Brexit discussion. No, Thank that was you. fantastic. Thanks so much, Frank. Let's, there, uh, before I throw it open to people, I really want to now, so microphone's at the ready, and if anyone has anywhere that they want to take, uh, do that. But since uh, Philip Hammond has been talking this morning, uh, and obviously the, the discussion sort of moves on to what he's been saying, do, do, do any of you think that he now has the kind of political weight, and possibly as a question for you first, Brom, to, to, to be able now in Cabinet to force this through and actually eventually that we do end up, as Ian was suggesting earlier on, we do end up simply staying in the customs union. Is that a serious thing that is now on the table politically in this country? It's on the table. That doesn't mean he's got the weight to get it through. And at this point, I would say no, but much, much to play for. May I clarify one thing? I totally mm -hmm. agree with Alan. You know, if we're out of the EU, we're out of the free trade agreements. The question is, could we, if we stayed in the customs union, argue for something better than Turkey's got. That's the bit that where lawyers are arguing, but it's, it's a long mm. shot. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I, I agree with, with Bromley that he, he's not there yet, but that's why in a setting like this, if you really want the customs union, you need to get behind the Chancellor, because we know privately he's been arguing for the customs union since the 24th of June last year, and lost that through last year in government. Uh, he's now pulling it back onto the table as a transitional issue. If you want it to be longer than transitional, it's now that you've really got to be uh, going for it because it's, he's now able to at least raise the issue publicly, which he wasn't last year. So it, it is beginning to get back onto the table, but it's not there yet. Mm. Uh, I throw it open to anyone who uh, has anything to say on any subject. I'm, I'm really interested in, in the yeah, gentleman right in the middle. I want to get back to the business of complications of trade agreements in a second that we've heard lots about. But people endlessly come on the Today programme and say you could do it in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and some of them are former trade negotiators too. It's very strange, but we'll get to that in a second. Here we are, gentleman in the middle. Um, yes, hello, Jean-Louis Evanson to have said. Um, as an alternative uh, to uh, staying within the customs union, do you think it's uh, a reasonable fallback situation to have a mutual recognition of technical standards? And to what extent would that allow current trade to continue in an acceptable way to the automotive industry in the UK and in the EU? Alan? Um, I think the customs union and uh, mutual recognition are really separate issues. Customs unions are formally speaking um, about tariffs. Um, and if the tariffs are all zero around the whole block and there's zero tariffs in between, you can be more relaxed about internal borders. Mutual recognition on standards is a single market type of issue. And so you could imagine that you had mutual recognition of standards, but nonetheless tariffs and serious customs formalities. You could imagine exactly the opposite. Many customs unions, well, to the extent there are customs unions around the world, they don't all have uh, technical uh, mutual recognition. So I think this is an important, I mean, I, I think uh, from what Mike Hawes was saying this morning, the customs union and the single market deliver different things to this industry. There's a complicated, there's a messy little overlap. Quite a lot of the customs coordination within Europe actually falls under single market legislation rather than customs union. But frankly, that's a detail. If we had the will to have really smooth customs within a customs union, we could do it. Um, but I think the point is that, uh, as he pointed out, you need the technical stuff and that single market mutual recognition. You need the zero tariffs and that's uh, customs unions. Yeah. Frank, you've got a th thought about that? Yes, uh, you reminded me of the uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, a terrible acronym, but it's the US-EU trade negotiations. The catchword there is something they call regulatory coherence, which is basically common standards. And I don't know if it was discussed earlier, but there's a question as to, number one, what happens with TTIP? What happens with the negotiation of a US-EU trade agreement? Donald Trump got rid of TPP within two days of becoming president. He has not done that with TTIP. TTIP has all sorts of problems, political problems in the United States and in Europe, mm -hmm. but right now the UK is still part of TTIP. So how does the UK deal with regulatory coherence if the TTIP, for in whatever form, goes forward without them? That's another complication. 
Mm. I throw it open again. Uh, anyone anywhere who wants to add anything or, or ask anything? Yeah, gentleman right at the front here. Here we go. Toby Richards Carpenter Birch from Dyson Bell. Can any of you see any convincing arguments that Britain leaving the EU could actually be a good thing economically, at any rate, long term? Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, the short answer is no, not e economically. I don't think it's a, a good thing. My general uh, analogy I have for this is that we, are, we have a reasonably smoothly running gearbox of an economy, and we're sitting here at the moment with a large cup of sand or bucket of sand and deciding how much of that we want to pour into, our, into the cogs of our economy. Let's hope we don't pour a lot in. If we leave without a deal, we'll put, chuck the whole lot in. Uh, so I don't think there's, you know, when, when, you, when you say what advantages are, they, they tend to be in two forms. One is trade deals with non-EU countries, which we might be quicker at signing than uh, the EU as a whole. I think we've heard today this is very, very complicated, so we shouldn't assume that as a benefit of leaving the EU. The second is some sort of, well, as it used to be described before last week, a bonfire of regulations. I think, well, I think we heard from uh, after last week, we won't be hearing so much of that. So the sort of sort of easy, oh, the EU is a terrible regulatory burden around our neck, or we're shackled to the corpse of the Eurozone, when the Eurozone is now growing really quite quickly. Uh, those sorts of arguments are beginning to sound a lot worse than they were, and no, I don't see any particular benefit for the UK. It's about loss mitigation rather than benefits. Roman? Yes, I, do, I, I agree. I don't think the economic arguments for leaving have ever stacked up very much, and Chris is a... Uh, uh, nicely demolish them. The, you know, the arguments, as we all know, for the stronger arguments for leaving uh, for those who um, espoused that were about immigration and control of, of, uh, of sovereignty over courts. And even on immigration, and on our discussion today has been very much about, um, about, about trade and not about skills, but in many business um, discussions, it is about uh, skills and access to skills above everything else. And that is a second sort of arm of uh, lobbying of the government. Alan. So one of the interesting things about the referendum outcome and then the period since the referendum is, in a sense, economists didn't rule the roost. Suddenly, after you know, a couple of decades where economics more or less was the ace of Trump's, it no longer was. And in a sense, what we've come back to after the election and Hammond saying, and a number of other people saying, no, now business and the economy must be front and centre, is in a sense a restoration, I think, of the old order where it used to be the case that an economic argument more or less carried the day. Sovereignty is all very fine, and closing your borders is all very fine if you're a bit uh, that way inclined, but it comes at a cost. And we never quite spelled these costs out in electoral terms, or to the electorate, and you know, in a sense, I think that scale has now tipped back to more where we've been used to mm. it in the last mm. few decades. Frank, can I ask you, if... Um we were in a position where we were outside the customs union. We, were, we presumably then apply to the WTO, do we, to, to, to be a separate member? How, do, how does you were describing the WTO, the sort of more modern setup of the WTO? Right. Right. Uh, how does that? How do? How do they receive us? Well, remember that um, in a perfect world, the WTO would be continuing what was started in the GATT, and, and just going quickly, after World War II, the biggest issue was tariffs, and countries agreed to reduce tariffs, and everybody benefited. Uh, but by the time you got to, say, the Tokyo round in 1979, non-tariff barriers were taking on greater importance. So the negotiations became more complicated. Then you have the WTO. Then you have the Doha round, which met an ignominious death because it was never really completed. And it really spelled the end of the WTO as a form for reaching multilateral agreements. And that is why we have all these free trade agreements. That's not the way the system was supposed to work. We weren't supposed to have bilateral free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. Because what's the purpose of NAFTA when you're giving treatment to Canada and Mexico that is discriminatory to everybody else. Professor Winters was right. You have to go to the 
WTO to get a waiver from your Article III commitments to treat every nation the same. So the system of the WTO has fallen apart and has become irrelevant for multilateral agreements. It's very good for dispute settlement. It's very good for doing smaller agreements, what are called plurilateral agreements, which means you can opt in. But if it was doing what it was supposed to be doing, we, we wouldn't have any bilateral or regional free trade agreements. We'd all be abiding by the WTO. So even if the UK wants to enter into all of these agreements, it has to settle its status in the WTO. And then it has to get waivers for every one of these free trade agreements that it intends to negotiate. Can you do all of that in a day? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alan, you want to do it? I, I no, I, I, the, the, the situation with the WTO is the UK is a member. I think there's no doubt about that. Right. We, a lot of our commitments and obligations have been notified through the European Union. And there's a sort of standard procedure for... Uh, as it were, relabeling them in the UK. There are a couple of really gritty little issues where the EU has entered an agreement for the whole of the EU and it needs to be divided up, both in agriculture. One is the right to subsidise agriculture and one is so-called tariff rate quotas, a commitment to import a certain volume of certain agricultural goods at zero tariffs. These are gritty things. Agriculture always takes forever in trade agreements. They almost certainly will trip us up. Mm. But we are members, we have got rights and obligations already. It's just a matter of sort of getting them written down properly in these two little gritty things. Mm -hmm. There is one area where there might be serious room for concern. We are not members of the government procurement agreement within the WTO, because in the last amendment of the government procurement agreement, the EU signed on behalf of all its members. So when we fall out of the EU, we fall out of the GPA. And the government procurement is something like 14-15% uh, of GDP. It's a huge, huge business. Mm. And in principle, uh, we would be under no obligation to let other people into our procurement markets, up go costs, and we would have no right to demand access to theirs. That's a bit of a simplification. Mm. But basically, um, that's the one place, I think, where you could say there's mm. serious disruption from us falling right. out in the WTO. Uh, do we have another question? Yes, yes, sir. here we go. Ian Henry, Auto Analysis. Um, everybody in this room, I think, will probably be delighted if we had some sort of transitional deal and so forth. What does the panel think the likelihood is of the EU giving us a transitional deal? Hmm. Uh, Broman. Quite high. Um, I think um, I think that that's what I've taken from the noises coming out of both Berlin and Paris at the moment. Um, that if uh, if we can get over the next couple of months and the, the negotiations actually get underway, then, then I think that's, that's, that's really quite high. Chris, you agree? Yes, yeah, so, so long as it's an off-the-peg deal, that it's not doesn't require lots of negotiation, we don't ask for too much, so we don't ask for uh, ending any sort of free movement of labour and yet keeping everything else, so we don't just have a sort of try and have your cake and eat it type of a transition. Can I just uh, the, the, the chance of the EU agreeing to that is much higher than the, the chance of part of the Tory party yeah. agreeing to that. Mm. I think that, that's yeah. the problem. <laughs> yeah. And that, of course, I mean, we should mention as well, the chances of an election uh, before any of this, uh, well, yeah. percentage-wise, what do we think? Before any of this? I mean, we're into it, but I mean, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. Not before the end of this week. Not before the end of this week. Okay, we're well, sticking your head out there, Bronwyn, but all right. If you're willing to go to that extent, then fine. Um, I mean, we haven't yeah. talked about Labour and, and, and their policy and, well, we, and how that goes for this industry. Mm -hmm. Possibly we should have done it. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but you know, should we be more? Oh, I think we should. I think we, if you can look at the Maastricht, how Labour behaved in the Maastricht Agreement, which was a much smaller issue under John Smith, 92, 93, when that went to the Commons. John Major had a bigger majority than Theresa May has and Labour just in a totally unprincipled way decided to find points of principle to vote against every aspect of the Maastricht legislation, siding with whoever it was. It was the sort of, mm. the, uh, yeah. John Major called the bastards yeah. in the white flapping coats yeah. at the time, uh, who were the Eurosceptics at the time. 
and Labour would vote for them all the time just to make it difficult for the government. I can't see any reason why Labour won't behave in precisely the same way this time around. Except they might not want to inherit it immediately. Mm -hmm. No. Or, uh, or go for another yeah. election. I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I, think, I mean, I think Labour, you know, the, the Labour manifesto said everything for everyone and mm. it was pretty difficult to work out exactly where it lay over the concrete elements of Brexit. It seems to me the issue is not so much what the Labour Party thinks, but whether the Labour Party will maintain its unity in the face of a sort of you know, a general yeah. turbulence in, in Westminster. It is a great time to be a journalist, as I said. Uh, huge respect. Thank you so much to our panel. A round of applause to them, please. Thank you.